All right, so my name is Michael Sveik and I'm Product Manager for Virtualization at SUSE. And along with me, I have Mike Latimer, who's uh, leading our virtualization engineering team. And we have a session about uh, virtualization technologies in the SUSE Enterprise Server mainly. And uh, it's an overview of what uh, we have been doing lately, what's in the latest release. We just announced SUSE Enterprise Server 12 Service Pack 2. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or interrupt or whatever, or at the end we will have some space for questions and answers as well. All right, before I start, uh, let me ask a few questions into the audience to do some little bit exercise after lunch to wake you up. So who is not using virtualization today? Anyone? All right, so you are at the right session. So what do you guys use? Anybody using uh, KVM? A couple. Uh, how about Zen? The rest VMware? Hyper-V, anyone? We've got a few guys as well. <laughs> Shy. <laughs> All right, so uh, we've got a mixture of different virtualization technologies in the room. And that's actually, uh, and let me grab this device. Uh, what Suze's aim is to support so we understand our customers support uh, or use different virtualization technologies and we want to enable them to use what they have been doing, to use like heterogeneous environments and uh, do all that with like single operating system and single set of applications or single set of, of Linux, Linux tools. So I've gone through the agenda. So virtualization. Virtualization is a topic for SUSE which is very important. However, we don't really have a specific virtualization offering because it's like native, it's key to all of our products. Pretty much all products which we have are including uh, virtualization components on, on some level. Obviously it starts with SUSE Enterprise Server, but it also goes to SUSE OpenStack Cloud using SUSE Enterprise Server as a base goes to SUSE Manager for managing physical as well as virtual environments. It goes to all other products uh, like uh, containers are related, studio for building, building workloads, and so on and so forth. So it's like a topic which is present everywhere, and uh, we make sure that uh, all these products uh, use all the latest like hardware technologies, software technologies, and, and everything like that. So as I mentioned, the virtualization is a key a key topic for SUSE, so we have been investing into it uh, quite a bit. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, we, in fact, we have been first ones in a couple of areas, like especially in the hypervisor space. We were the first ones to de deliver Zen uh, hypervisor in enterpri enterprise Linux. We were the first ones to have KVM in an enterprise Linux. And uh, we continue to invest there, so for instance, in our OpenStack distro, we also have uh, Zen and KVM support, along with VMware and Hyper-V. So it's again in line with what our customers use and what, uh, what's our virtualization story. So our virtualization story is uh, kind of four different quadrants, depending where you have data on premise. That means uh, on the left and on the right, whether you have data somewhere hosted by your service provider in the cloud, and also whether you are on the hosting part, whether it's a host, or whether you are uh, as, a, as a guest workload. So obviously we cover all these four topics and uh, all these two, four topics are important for us and each requires different, uh, different set of tools. So for instance, the host part, it's a hypervisor. We, I mean, we have a hypervisor included in SUSE Enterprise Server, so you don't need to purchase any other products. We actually have two hypervisors in case one would not be enough. So we do have KVM, we do have Zen, Zen we have had since like forever. It's been there for years, it's perfectly stable, it's used out there. So if you have been using Zen, feel free to continue. Uh, we are not dropping it, uh, so it's uh, like a viable choice. On the other hand, we have KVM. KVM has seen a lot of like huge traction lately and we do invest in KVM. We do support all the major platforms we have. So far it's been x86 but also uh, IBM Power and IBM uh, Z systems. We do have KVM on of all uh, these platforms, and lately, with the ARM announcement, we do also support KVM on ARM. 
So if you want to have a look, give it a try, feel free to grab uh, the ARM uh, version of SLES. You can use KVM, you can use all the virtualization tools there and uh, see how it works. And it's uh, all the same set of tools. Uh, that's on one side, that's like a regular virtualization, traditional one. On the other side, we also do have container technologies, virtualization without the hypervisor. We have uh, LXC there and Docker, and I will talk about those a little later as an outline. That was the host part. If you are like hosting our workloads on the guest part, it's there's something what we call perfect guest strategy. And the, the aim is to uh, have uh, Suzanne's Enterprise Server running perfectly independent of the underlying environment. So we support obviously SUSE hypervisors, both KVM and Zen, but we also do support uh, other hypervisors, third party hypervisors like VMware, Hyper-V, but also Oracle, VM, Citrix, and, and others. And also you can extend this towards public clouds uh, and other hosted environments like OpenStack based or Microsoft Azure or other like uh, business based clouds. So the aim is really to have Susan Enterprise Server be perfect guest in all these environments. So wherever, whenever you need Linux as a guest there, you can go to SUSE and have uh, Susan Enterprise Server running there. So that's the general aim. I've mentioned cloud already. We do span different cloud environments uh, from private to public. So with private clouds, we do have our open stack distribution. With, uh, for public clouds, we, we work with pretty much all major cloud providers, including Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and, and others. And we also support hybrid cloud uh, setups. So we provide tools which allow you to manage Linux uh, in both uh, these environments, both in private and public area. So for instance, not only you can have uh, SLES running there in the same way in private and public cloud, you also can have uh, can use tools like SUSE Manager to patch and update, monitor, deploy images, both in private cloud environments or regular data centers as well as public clouds. So it's uh, like a, a, lot of flex a lot of flexibility and a lot of choice for you guys, what you want to do based on your, your own requirements. So the overall ecosystem, it's uh, spanning, uh, like, as I said, pretty much complete SUSE portfolio, but there are a few key products I want to mention. And obviously that SUSE Enterprise Server is the underlying platform, which includes hypervisors and novel tools. And on top of that, we have uh, SUSE Manager, SUSE OpenStack Cloud, and SUSE Enterprise Storage. And uh, these three, help you to build a virtualized data center or software defined data center as it's called today. So OpenStack is for obviously uh, compute uh, and uh, other resource abstraction and uh, enterprise storage is uh, integrating with, uh, with OpenStack and SUSE Manager is a tool to uh, patch and update and manage Linux in all these environments. And all this is related to virtualization and hypervisors and tools are our key components there. So this is a high level story Let's, uh, let's go to the specifics and let me actually switch over to Mike. Thank you. Uh, about SP2 and recent news. Okay, thanks Mikhail. So as Mikhail mentioned, uh, I'm Mike Latimer. I manage the, the virtualization engineering team here at SUSE. And I was very uh, happy that he polled the audience and found uh, the, the various uh, ways you're using virtualization in your environment. And one thing that you're, you're probably very aware of and that is that uh, the virtualization spectrum is very, very broad. There are many ways you can use virtualization and many ways that it can be implemented in your environment. As engineers, we love to hear how you are using it, especially how our technologies are helping you or how our technologies are hindering you. So if you run into problems or if you just want to tell us about your use cases, we would love for you to come by our booth and talk to us and give us specifics. We love feature uh, requests or enhancement requests or ideas that you might have as an engineering team, we, we really hope to be able to provide product that you find extremely useful. So this is what we've done with SP2 uh, and a little bit about what we plan to do in the future. And if you have contributions, I'm certainly willing to, uh, to hear from you. So those of you that have been with uh, the, the SUSE environment for a while probably are aware that there were some significant changes between SLES 11 and SLES 12. Uh, particularly from the Zen perspective, we dropped the Zen D daemon that you're familiar with and we moved to uh, LiveZen Lite. Uh, and this LiveZen Lite environment has, has uh, 
uh, done some, some small changes that you'll see from an administrative perspective. For example, XM commands change to XL commands and things like that. Uh, but along with that transition, we, we uh, updated quite a bit of the stack. Um, we also converted our uh, container story from LXC to libvirt LXC. And by the way, I should mention that, that we do still support libvirt LXC in addition to Docker. The, the purpose for Docker, the use case for Docker is with application containers. And when we talk about containers now with libvirt LXC, we're specifically referring to system containers. So we do still have that, and that still falls under our virtualization hat, as opposed to the Docker guys, they, they focus on their application containers. Um, QMU was significantly updated um, in this last 12 days. We've continued this trend with SP2, uh, where we've been able to update the entire stack. You can see that the, the latest vir uh, virtualization components, we have the versions are up here, Zen 4.7. Uh, QMU has been updated at 2.6.1. LibVirt is now at a version 2.0. Um, that's our general philosophy, is we want to stay as current as possible while maintaining the stability that you rely on. So let's talk about a few of the, the specific changes that took place. Um, the, the primary focus behind SP2 really is to make sure the product is stable, but also add those enhancements that bring the product current to what you uh, could use in your environment to increase your efficiency. One of the big changes was updating libguestfs to a new version. And this is actually interesting because libguestfs, I, I speak to a lot of people about that, and they're not horribly familiar with all the, the vast functionality of that particular uh, set of tools. So libguestfs includes things like a, a vert V2V migration, which allows you to migrate from Zen to KVM if you're in the mode to do that. And I should tell, uh, I should make this statement real quick for those of you that are using Zen, we are in no way saying this is a move you should make. You need to evaluate your individual requirements and decide if KVM is a better platform or not. If you decide to stick with Zen and the, the privileged domain model that it has, that's perfectly fine with us. We like that as well, and we're certainly uh, continuing to invest our efforts in both Zen and KVM. Um, with this uh, vert V2V, change with a new version of guestfs, these type of conversions have been sped up dramatically because it was a complete rewrite of that particular tool. There are also the ability to do physical to virtual migrations with a, with a tool that's in tech preview. It's vert p to v, oddly enough. Uh, but this physical to virtual migration really is intended to be a, a test phase. I wouldn't necessarily rely on this because of the tech preview status, but if you get a chance to, to use it and have some feedback for us, we'd love to hear that. Um, another visible change that's interesting is improvements in SPICE. And something that, uh, that I tripped across as I was doing some testing was uh, USB redirection. So if you're at your machine now and you're, you're uh, running QMU remotely or, or running your, your uh, vert manager remotely, you can open up a vert manager window, plug in a local USB stick, and it will actually be automatically passed through to that guest. You need to be aware of how that works. And if, you're, if you, that guest is not in focus, it won't happen. Um, but there are some, some significant uh, improvements in the ease of use of this sort of uh, uh, solution, I guess, the USB pass-through. There are improvements with the guest agent. Guest agent is a tool that allows you to, uh, to, to better communicate with the guest. So in the case of, say, shutting down the guest, specific commands can be issued to the guest to. Uh, to make sure the file system is frozen properly or unthawed properly during these sorts of suspended res resumes. That's been improved quite a bit. And many other areas inside our, our world. The VMDP, the Virtual Machine Driver Pack, which are virtual, uh, uh, para-virtual and vert.io drivers for Zen and KVM environments for Windows machines. Those uh, are getting a refresh, and we'll mention that in a bit. But Hanu Hyper-V drivers, VMware tools, pretty much Everything you could put under the virtualization umbrella has been, uh, in our opinion, improved, and uh, we think you'll like it. Let's talk about even more specifics, drill down on a few things. From a, a Zen perspective, we're at Zen version uh, 4.7.0, and as I mentioned before, this is a libzen Lite, is the, uh, is the interface for this, so, so you can use Excel directly to communicate with that layer. But our recommended approach for management is still through libvirt. So those of you that are familiar with, uh, with Versh, that's certainly what we would recommend. 
Uh, there is one significant change with SP2 that I want to spend some time on, and that is this final, uh, or this first bullet point of new features, PVOps kernel. Who knows what that actually means? A couple people. Okay, the big guy in the back, okay. <laughs> PVOps kernel. What this actually is, is it's a, a dropping of kernel-zen. The kernel-zen was a zenified kernel that provided pair virtual drivers for use in Zen environments. So if you wanted to run a pair virtual VM under Zen, you had to use kernel-zen. Your DOM zero in Zen was always kernel-zen. That complicates things. Anytime you've got multiple flavors or variants of a kernel, think about the, the efforts to uh, backport uh, security vulnerabilities to that specific uh, kernel and make sure it's, it's as fully tested as other branches of the kernel. There's all kinds of complications keeping those things in sync from a development perspective. And so we finally gone to the PVOps kernel, which is uh, a modification to, to the default Linux kernel that has been fully accepted upstream that allows the kernel to detect whether or not it's running in a Zen environment or a KVM environment and take the appropriate code paths as necessary. So that simplifies development for us quite a bit. We now have one kernel tree that we can contribute patches to and, and make a single security vulnerability fix to, and it's applicable for, for all versions. Uh, the, the benefits are not limited to just us, and actually I'll mention a couple more on the next slide, but I, I realize I haven't advanced that slide. Actually, let's do this now. Let's jump over to PVOps. Um, so I mentioned the, uh, the, the, the maintaining of the kernels being a big point. But there are some very important benefits to you. And there's some things like uh, indirect descriptors. Indirect descriptors is an interesting story because uh, it's the ability to, to uh, allocate additional segments for, uh, for block I.O., basically. And this is a new feature that was in an upstream driver. It was a pair of virtual, uh, or a PVOps driver that simply wouldn't work with our Zenified kernel because of inconsistencies in the way that uh, uh, that was allocated. So when we move to the PVOps kernel, we gain all the benefits from the upstream development model and those same uh, upstream developers we have working for us at SUSE as well. So we contribute to this upstream model. But as these new features roll in, like indirect descriptors, they are now immediately available to you. There's also uh, something called PVHVM mode. PVHVM is, is rather interesting, and it's worth um, jumping up. I just realized maybe I should have ordered these slightly differently as I'm talking about them. But PVHVM is pretty important because prior to SLES 12 SP2, there were two ways you could run a VM under Zen. The first is in paravirtual mode, and the second is in fully virtual mode. The difference being paravirtual machine knows that it's running under Zen. And so it has optimizations inside that code to take the quickest code path possible. Uh, fully virtual mode has the benefit of being completely unmodified. Well, in order to run in that mode, you have to have some hardware accelerations, some capabilities of the CPU in order to, to be able to virtualize those machines. And what has happened is the development world has realized that being fully virtual or fully paravirtual, neither are completely ideal. And so these two models of virtualization are converging in the middle and being able to uh, have a machine that takes advantage of those hardware accelerations where necessary or take the pair virtual improvements where, where available, that's really the ideal scenario. So P PVHVM is where we are with SLES 12 SP2. And if you're running anything prior to SLES 12 SP2, you cannot be in this mode. The main difference of uh, PVHVM versus a regular fully virtual machine, is PVHVM has, uh, it's a fully virtual model uh, guest with paravirtual drivers for the disk and the network, plus it has uh, paravirtual uh, interrupts and timers. So it really has, uh, instead of having emulated interrupts and timers, it now has paravirtual interrupt and timers. And anytime you can go paravirtual, it's going to be better than non-paravirtual. In the future, we expect this convergence to continue. And from the paravirtual side, you're going to see something called HVM Lite. If you pay attention to the development process, you'll see there's PVH, 
being mentioned and HVM light and PVH V2 and all these kinds of things. The reality is HVM light is probably what it's going to be called, but it's going to take paravirtual and add those virtual hardware extensions that you're used to. Yes, sir, you had a question? I just have one question. Sure. If, I, if I'm running full virtual data, mm -hmm. um, I Mm -hmm. You will not have a problem. So the question is, if I'm, if I'm running SLES 12 SP1 or before in a fully virtual mode and I want to upgrade to SP2 and I copy that machine over, is that correct? Right. Um, so if those virtual machines, are they going to be upgraded to SP2? Or staying with SP1? Okay, Windows virtual machines. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you're talking a host upgrade. In a host upgrade scenario, everything should work just fine. Um, we don't ex anticipate any problems at all, despite the fact that in your new SP2 environment, you have a PVOps enabled kernel running in DOM0. That same fully virtual guest will work just fine on SP1 or before and migrate over to SP2 without issue. So that should not be a problem at all. If you are updating a guest from SP1 to SP2, when you upgrade the guest to SP2, if it's a fully virtual guest, it will automatically start using this PVHVM path and you'll have that benefit. So there's no additional steps that are needed to actually enable this. Let's jump back and I'll cover a couple of quick topics I skipped over. Um, we have updated QMU Zen. Um, previously, we had a very old version of QMU Zen that was really there for compatibility reasons and legacy purposes, and we finally decided to rely on the same QMU that we ship with KVM. So again, we get the additional testing, the additional compatibility, uh, and we don't expect this change to cause any problems to, to customers as well. Um, we've added UEFI support, and you'll see this in both KVM and Zen, you can now have UEFI-based guests, which quite a number of people have been asking for. And PVUSB. PVUSB was something that we lost in the SLES 12 move to LibZen Lite, and it is finally back um, and should be, should be usable for you. We talked about PVOps. The other point about PVOps that I wanted to spend a second on was the, a side effect of getting rid of kernel-zen. How do you know if you're running in a Zen environment? If you're like me, I will SSH to one of my test boxes, and in the past, the easiest thing to do is do a uname. Hey, is kernel dash Zen running? If it is, guess what? I'm in a Zen environment. The reality is you can't do that now. So here's this uname output, and, and you'll see that I'm running a default kernel. So instead of that, I have to do some kind of Excel command. I have to query Zen and say, is this Zen? In this case, I've got an Excel list, and it shows that there's some domains running. There's many ways to do that. DOM0 has a file, a proc, zen, priv, cmd. So if you have a script that's SSHing to these box and actually checking and doing something if it's zen versus kvm, you can check for the existence of that particular file. If you're interested in knowing if you're running in PV mode or HVM mode or PVHVM mode, what you want to pay attention to is this booting paravirtual kernel on Zen HVM line in D message of your guest. It's kind of complicated. I'm actually working with support. We're going to document this better. So if you're interested in determining what mode your guest is running in, you should be able to answer that question through that D message process. The final bullet point about PVHVM, or excuse me, PVOps, is this important point. With PVOps, block devices have to be named uh, XVDA. So what this means, and, and actually I think I'm, I'm saying it backwards in about 26 different ways, but uh, what this means is if you're using a pair virtual machine prior to SLES 12 SP2, your block device could be named SDA, could be named HDA, it could be named XVDA, Nothing really enforced the naming of the devices. But what happens with 
this PV ops kernel and the new uh, block front driver that is in there and the, the way it communicates with the block back driver, the devices are forcibly named X, V, D, A, B, C, and D. You may have seen this if you use public cloud environments like Amazon uh, or those sorts of environments. You'll see them forced, forcibly set to X, V, D, A. That's fine as long as you know beforehand that if you're taking a machine and you're moving it from one environment to another, say in an SP1 to SP2 upgrade case, you do have to pay attention to things like Etsy FS tab or the grub configuration. And if you know about those tweaks beforehand, it's very easy to just manually make that change and you're okay. But it's something to certainly be aware of. Okay. Yes, Jason. So on those uh, PV block devices you mentioned, is that including in fully virtualized guests as well as pair virtualized guests? Uh, no, it is just pair virtual guests, yeah. So those fully virtual guests, they're still going to be referred to as whatever they are. So your Windows machines will still see your C drive or whatever. And, yeah. yeah. Correct, correct. Actually, let me think about this for a second because, yeah. Okay, I was thinking Windows, and in reality from a SLES perspective, SLES perspective, either one, uh, whether it's fully virtual or paravirtual, will enforce the XVD naming convention. That's definitely true. Okay. Sorry for the confusion on that particular topic. <laughs> okay, let's talk about uh, KVM and Zen. Uh, KVM and QMU. So QMU version 261 is what is available with SP2. Um, we have one new architecture this go around, which is uh, new and exciting. Um, and that is ARCH64. So ARCH64, we do actually provide KVM for that architecture. From a supportability perspective, because of the vast array of ARCH64 hardware that is out there, we haven't been able to say, yes, we always support ARCH64 you know, platforms for KVM and QMU. However, we support partner-specific use cases. And what that means is if your partner is recommending AR64, you're going to a vendor and they're saying this is what you want, that is, that is actually what we will support. So we expect it to be an interesting platform in the future and we're investing a lot of efforts into it. And if you are using this, um, we certainly uh, would love to hear your success stories. And if you do uh, run into problems, we'd like to hear about those as well. Uh, as with Zen, LibVirt is still the preferred management layer. You can run QMU directly. Uh, if you're savvy enough to do that, you certainly can. But uh, LibVirt abstracts that out and eases some of the, the challenges with that, with that potentially painful command line. There's quite a number of new features in this world. Uh, LibISCSI is uh, something that has been uh, uh, requested by a lot of people, and that's actually it provides improved support for iSCSI devices. We have 3D acceleration through VertIO GPU. And that 3D acceleration is, is actually kind of interesting. Um, it's not passing through your graphical card to the guest. It's actually creating a virtual graphic card. And when you do that, you can expect to get much better performance than your typical video cards, but certainly not bare metal performance. So what, what we've seen in our testing is about a 50% performance reduction, which is actually pretty good. Um, and you can take that and use that same VertIO graphical card on multiple guests. And so, you know, the more guests you spin up, um, obviously that will be reduced a bit, but you can share that load across those machines and, and actually get pretty good performance out of that NVIDIA card. Um, we do support UEFI support through uh, QMU OVMF, which uh, you're welcome to come and, and talk to us in the lab and we can show you how this works but it does give you that uh, EFI boot support. We also have something called post-copy live migration. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a second because that's an interesting change. And finally, PCI pass-through is now officially deprecated. And for those of you that have been paying attention to the PCI pass-through or using that, you'll know that there are some security risks and Intel and other vendors have said, you know, we, we need to be cautious uh, uh, and not fully support PCI pass-through because what's ev whatever's in the BIOS of that particular card as it gets presented to the guest could actually be, uh, be something that's exploitable. So that's been deprecated in, func in favor of uh, VFIO. So let's talk about this post-copy live migration and make sure you understand the differences. 
in a traditional migration environment, what happens is I have a couple of machines, and I want to take a VM and move it from uh, the source to the target. As I do that, a process tries to synchronize memory between these two machines. And if you have a highly active guest or a very large guest, it takes quite a bit of time to synchronize that memory. If you do reach the point of convergence where the memory is the same, the guest is then moved from the first machine to the second machine, and, and everything continues on as though there were no interruptions. The post-copy live migration attempts to solve this conversion process a problem by immediately migrating the guest from point A to point B. So the guest is immediately running on the new node. And after, uh, as that guest is running on the new node, through the use of page faults and everything else, memory is slowly transferred over to the target node. And after the target is fully synchronized, then the migration is considered completed. Now, that solves uh, some problems for us and allows us to move quickly, but it introduces one big one. And that is, what happens if in the middle of this process, the network drops? And so I can no longer reach the, the source machine. I'm running on the target, but I don't have all my memory. That's kind of a bad situation. So there are inherent risks using either method, but pay attention to your particular infrastructure and decide which one is most applicable to your workload. And these two modes, um, they're both getting a lot of attention. We, you know, if there are problems in Canada, we certainly are interested in fixing those. Um, but post copy live migration is kind of the, the new interesting capability that, uh, that is getting a lot of attention. And, and generally speaking, as long as you don't have those network instabilities, it works quite well. So what about your mixed environments? Those that are still uh, in a mixed environment between SLE 11 and SLE 12, there are a couple of points to, to make. First of all, migration is supported from a current service pack to the service pack plus one. So those that are using SLES 12 SP1 can migrate to SLES 12 SP2. Um, there is, it's not actually supported to migrate the other direction, so pay attention to that. However, um, there is no live migration between SLES 11 and SLES 12. You can, you can migrate between SLES 11 and SLES 12, but there's no live migration because of the libzen light uh, from transition from the old Zen D. So that's, that's something to pay attention to. Um, if you are in a Zen and a KVM environment, we've mentioned this tool before, but the vert V to V uh, is the tool that will go ahead and convert from your Zen environment to your KVM environment. And that tool is non-destructive. It takes your source image, copies it over to the destination, and converts it. The new version of vert V to V, which is included with SP2, actually does the conversion through the use of an overlay, and it makes sure the machine can convert first prior to doing the copy. So if you have any problems it will, uh, that will prevent the successful migration, you'll find out about it very quickly. And it does that using SSH keys, uh, so, so the whole copy is done in a very secure manner. I wanted to mention the supported hosts. Um, if you're running SLES 12 SP2 as a guest, we are supported in a large amount of environments. Uh, and you can see pretty much all the supported versions of SLES, the current versions of, of uh, VMware vSphere, several versions of Windows 20, 2008 through 2016, um, and Citrix Zen Server and Oracle VM. We do have customers using all of these products. Um, and our strategy is to be a perfect guest, so we intend to work well in all of these and uh, work hard to make it so. So if you ever are using some of these, even if they're not SUSE, it's okay. Let us know if there are problems and we will fix those issues for you. We're certainly interested in that. I wanted to mention VMware specifically, though. Um, we do have open VM tools included as part of the part of the distribution. We work closely with VMware to make sure those VMware tools are current and uh, available out of the box so that you can, you can leverage those tools as you would in a, in a VMware environment. In addition to the tools themselves, we have in-tree kernel modules that provide for things like ballooning um, and making sure that we've got proper network drivers, things like that. We do have a couple of new features with OpenVM Tools 10.0.7, which is what's currently in SP2. Uh, by the way, that does get updated on a fairly regular basis, so there'll be an update before too long, I'm sure, to 10.1.0, which just barely came out. 
But these features are shared folders and drag and drop and copy and paste. I wanted to point out these features specifically because they're nifty features, but they accomplish these things through fairly insecure means. Uh, and because of that, most of these features are disabled by default in ESX environments. So server, server environments for VMware, they disable these features, and so it is certainly not recommended to use them in our environment either. There's ways you can turn them on, but be aware that there are some security risks there. If you're using VMware Workstation, it'll work just fine. Um, the tools will certainly be there and give you that functionality. Uh, and as I mentioned, we fully support our work and we work closely with VMware if there are any problems on their side that they need to work with, and they've been great partners for us. The same is also true with Microsoft. We work very, very hard to ensure that our Hyper-V drivers are current. We include these with, the, with our kernel. So SLES 12 SP2 will have the, the latest drivers. And there's a couple of things to point out. Um, version numbers in particular, we get this question every so often. People will see that Microsoft has updated their, their LIS, their Linux Integration Services drivers to a newer version. And they ask, what about you, Sousa? And our answer is, we've had those versions as part of our kernel for quite some time now. So don't pay attention to the version numbers. It's not applicable. It's not the same thing. Um, but we work very closely with Microsoft and have regular, uh, regular syncs with them to make sure we are on the same page. Um, Azure, this is a new image that is part of the Azure public cloud. Uh, SLES 12 came out with an RDMA-based image for very low latency kind of environments. Uh, this image is really interesting. It, it came out um, back in, uh, it was right before SP1 that I think it came out. But it is going to be revved in the near future to also be based on SLES 12 SP2. So if you're using that image or have seen that image and you're in that environment where you need those low latencies, uh, keep an eye out for an update uh, on this particular image. Finally, from a supported guest perspective, uh, we support a lot of different guests. And uh, uh, hopefully, if you're using any of these guests, you'll, I mean, something outside of this scope, let us know. But generally speaking, we're pretty lenient and still support uh, guests that, that SUSE doesn't actually support. Most of those guests are provided as a uh, kind of a best effort to help you in the migration process, because we realize many environments have thousands upon thousands of VMs, and it's simply challenging to update those guests. So you can see we've got all the versions of SLES. Uh, there's a few of these that are marked as tech preview because we, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't really encourage the use of those. Um, believe it or not, we do still support netware, although we're hopeful that not too many people are actually using that. And we support many versions of Microsoft Windows. Um, I did want to point out that the, the Windows 10 and 8, the desktop variants, these are supported through our best effort. And the way we provide this support for Windows is through the use of the Virtual Machine Driver Pack. The Virtual Machine Driver Pack takes the fully virtual Windows guest and adds the paravirtual or virtio drivers uh, into, uh, into that machine so it can take advantage of the hypervisor, uh, the, the, the capabilities that you get there. VMDP 2.4 is in the process of being released. Uh, it's basically, it's completed the, the WICL certification testing that takes place and will be released um, before the end of the month. And uh, it does include support for Windows Server 2016. So if you're on the cutting edge and you've already got 2016, you're playing around with it, be sure to put uh, VMDP on. When you put VMDP on, I, I had a question about, from a performance perspective, does VMDP really help? And the reality is, as hardware is becoming more and more capable and faster and faster, the differences with or without the pair of virtual drivers or virtio drivers are relatively minimal, but you do have the uh, improved interrupt handling, uh, the guest agent support, and certainly the efficiency of the network and the block drivers. So we certainly recommend using VMDP. There's a unified driver model now. So technically, if you install a VMDP on a guest that's running under Zen, you can take that guest and move it over to KVM and the driver itself doesn't have to change. The driver will know the differences uh, and be able, to, be able to work properly. And as usual, we're continually enhancing this product to make sure it addresses your needs. Uh, 
Briefly from an Outlook perspective, SLES 12 SP3 is something that we're planning for now and obviously the future. Um, we will continue to support both Zen and KVM. So those of you that raised your hand in the Zen days, uh, the, the Zen customers, certainly there's nothing to worry about. We are going to continue to support you. There are a lot of people that think it's time to, to move from Zen to KVM, but that is a, a personal choice and up to you. Uh, we're certainly going to support you regardless of that choice. We always focus on hardware enablement in these updates. So as Intel comes out with new processors or uh, a, you know, the AR64 world progresses, we will continue to make sure we, we leverage that as much as possible within our product. Um, we do expect further enhancements to be made from a guest perspective as that convergence takes place between the para-virtual and fully virtual environments and further improvements in that environment. One common, somewhat common request we get is vir nested virtualization. Can I run a Zen server inside a KVM guest? Some people actually want to do that. I mean, if you pay attention to file systems, every time you add a different layer of complexity, a different file system, a different LVM layer, whatever it is, performance kind of degrades, and the same could certainly be true from nested virtualization. Do you want to, you know, a KVM host running under Zen, which is running under KVM. I mean, how deep do we need to go here? Uh, there's a lot of questions about that. If you're interested in that technology, certainly let us know. Um, if you're interested in any advancements or enhancements in, in the virtualization space, I'm very interested in, in hearing your recommendations or ideas. And I wanted to say one more thing before I turn it back over to Mikhail to wrap things up. And that is, uh, virtualization can be complicated. Um, Marcus knows. Most people know that it's, it's certainly not a, a simple topic. Uh, we do our best to, uh, to try to help you be successful in, in your efforts. Jim gave a presentation yesterday, unfortunately, so I can't recommend you go to it, but I can recommend that you watch his session where he talks about tuning for virtualization, some, some recommendations to make changes. Those same recommendations we add into our virtualization guide and our virtualization best practices guide. The best practices guide in particular is something we view as a living document. As we encounter new tips and tricks, it is our goal to make sure those end up back in the, in the best practices guide. So certainly um, pay attention to those guides. And the general virtualization guide um, is a good one to walk you through the, you know, the, the overall aspects of virtualization. I think it's time for okay, Mikhail perfect. to wrap things up for us. Any questions so far? Anybody? Anybody awake? Yes, first question. Over there. I have one question. Um, you're talking about KVM and uh, and Zen. Uh, what's the difference between the two? Like, what's the difference? Zen? Zen, yeah. Thank you. Um, you were saying that if you're using Zen, you can use it as a search for me. Am I supposed to think that in the near future, Zen is going to be the KVM? That was the threat years ago when KVM came out. That's what everybody said. Oh, Zen's going to go away. It's time to move to KVM. The, and, and some of our competitors that you may be aware of have dropped Zen. Uh, the reality is we have customers that are using Zen. We think there is a use case for Zen. Um, Mikel's the official PM here, but but I personally like the fact that we support both hypervisors and I get good feedback from customers that do. So from my perspective, um, I hope that doesn't change anytime soon. Yeah, right. So, and they're actually big environments, uh, even not related to SUSE, who support and runs in like Amazon. It's uh, almost completely on Zen. So I don't see Zen going away, like definitely not anytime soon. And there's also like new things going on, like the, the new unikernel stuff. It's uh, a lot built on, on top of Zen, so there's like still a lot, like, uh, a lot of life in Zen hypervisor and the uh, ecosystem around it, so. Okay, you had a question? Yeah. For the management, like you just uh, told, uh, you mentioned uh, tools that to manage uh, hardware and the build of things. Uh, you say planning to have or integrating to the system manager, I don't know, uh, to manage uh, graphically those environments, the, the 
Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually have like two sets of tools. One is included in Slash, it's an enterprise server. It's a virtualization manager, Weirdman. It's included there. It's like if you are fine managing one box or like few, few machines. On the other side, uh, we, we actually looked into virtualization management like a few years ago, what like uh, Obert did and, and others. And uh, at the same time, we were evaluating OpenStack. And we, uh, what we figured was that OpenStack and all the private cloud infrastructure can cover everything on virtualization management can cover and provides more so we can do self-service. I mean, you can set up OpenStack in a constrained way to like act like a regular virtualization management like VMware has it, but you can do much more there. So that's why we have been focusing on, on OpenStack. Obviously, I mean, I understand there are customers who are like running small environments and might not have uh, might not want to have OpenStack deployed. We have been considering that if you have uh, like any need in that space, just uh, let me know and you can work out something there as well. So as Mike said, we would like to have uh, your feedback guys, what you are doing, what's, what's the scale and uh, what your plans are and we are flexible there to a large extent. Yes, please. So I can't recall the minimal OpenStack requirements from the top of my head, but I think you can do pretty small OpenStack deployments with a couple of hosts. I don't. I think you need just like one or two, uh, like management overhead nodes for the OpenStack environment, but you can easily do like a couple of hosts. I, I mean nodes, compute nodes and storage nodes or, or like. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's one of the like, biggest points of OpenStack because you can start with a trim down environment and you can expand and also allow your guys to do some self-service and maybe like some uh, accounting and, and stuff like that, what private cloud is good for. So that's the point. All right, so we talked about virtualization and I figured uh, I spent a uh, few minutes on, on containers because it's related to virtualization quite a lot. Is anybody here who is using containers already to some extent? A little bit? What, what kind of container technologies do you use? Docker? Yeah. So uh, for those who haven't been into containers too much, container is something called virtualization without the hypervisor. So it's pretty much running the processes on a, on a shared kernel, which are isolated by like different uh, Linux kernel mechanisms like namespaces and, uh, and others. So you can, to a large extent, run the same workload in a VM or inside of a container, and they are isolated to, uh, to our extent as well. However, in the case of virtualization, it's uh, much more safer or complete because it takes advantage of hardware assist technologies. Unlike in containers, the only isolation technology is uh, what kernel provides. So there is a little less uh, security there, but still it can be useful in cases where you actually trust the environment uh, where multiple containers run next to each other. If you are concerned, you can also run the containers on top of virtual machines and take advantage of both, uh, both technologies at the same time. There are two types of containers. There are actually system containers and application containers. The distinction is uh, how much processes are running. So in general, uh, if you are moving uh, the complete installation to a container, you can do it. It's uh, what's called system container, so it has all the demons, all the processes running, and all the like multiple applications. Just uh, it just doesn't have a kernel, so that's the difference between virtual machine and a system container. But you can go a step further and uh, do something what's called application container, and in that case, only one process, one application is running inside of a container, so you don't have any like system demons, you don't have any agents, you don't have any processes running, it's just like wet one application process. So it's much, it's much more efficient when compared to system containers or VMs. However, it obviously requires more work to make sure that that application, that process runs uh, in that modified environment. We do support both of these, 
So for system containers, we do have uh, LXC or actually Liberate LXC because it's uh, system containers, it's, it more resembles virtual machine. So it makes sense to actually have a unified uh, tool set, uh, Liberate based for managing VMs as, as well as containers. That's pretty useful. For application containers, we, uh, we have Docker because that happens to be the most used and the most like, advanced technology there for application containers. So uh, I'm, uh, I have a couple of slides on Docker for those who haven't uh, seen too much. There was a session yesterday, there was another session specifically on uh, containers and Docker on, on Friday. And uh, in case of system containers, it resembles like regular operation, operating system. So there is not too much difference from regular virtual machines or physical even. For containers, as application containers, the difference is quite big. So I, that's why I will spend a couple of couple of slides here. So the story which Suze uh, outlines to our customers is this kind of life cycle for, for containers. So from creation to running to maintenance and so on and so forth. And you need to go through, through this life cycle in all these cases and that's not something people often, often do. So obviously you need to create the containers but you need to run them in a secure environment. You need to create them from secure, secure sources and you need to make sure that they stay secure even if you are running and then further on as you get updates, you make sure that uh, these updates run again in the same environment. So uh, we have done a couple of things uh, from the start. We do provide, uh, obviously, Susanx Enterprise Server packages. We do provide minimal Susanx Enterprise Server images for containers. So these are really bare bones images and uh, you, you take those images and start using them to build your own containers. You put them into your private registry. The registry is a repository for, for container images. We have a project uh, called Portus. You, you can see the screenshot. Portus is the uh, interface for this private registry where you have all your images inside of your data center. So if you want to play with Docker or something that's called Docker Hub, it's a community repository with all kinds of images. Anybody can put anything there, anybody can get anything from there. Just be there if you want to play with it. It's arbitrary stuff. You might most likely not want to take that stuff inside your data center. You want to build your images or at least images from, from some trusted source. And Portus allows for hosting these images on premise. It also allows for collaboration. You can define teams, assign roles, and uh, set up some authentication, authentication mechanisms for this private registry, so not everyone has right access to this, to your private registry and uh, you have a complete control over what's going on. So that's uh, hosting and creation of images. Once you need to, once you have all this set up, you need to run them somewhere. We have, uh, we actually have had uh, something for quite some time. It's called Juice, Just Enough Operating System. It's a minimal version of Suzanne's Enterprise Server. It's a like small platform which you can use to run uh, containers, but not only containers. You can use it to run, to host virtual machines. You can use it uh, to host your own workloads. It's like flexible, yet it's pretty minimal and bare bones. So that's the advantage of Juice because you can use all the current processes and knowledge and uh, apply that to this, this constraint and strip down environment. And uh, that's what we have today. You can already use it. We also uh, are working on something called uh, Container as a Service Platform. And as part of that, we will have something what's, uh, what whose current code name is MicroOS. So minimal container specific uh, operating system version. So it would have like something like Juice, but it would be focused on containers only and would include the orchestration pieces so that you can actually run a uh, cluster for uh, like container cluster in an easy way. So we have a platform, you can use either Juice or micro OS and uh, decide what, what fits best for, for your environment. And uh, once you have it running, uh, one item which, uh, uh, which I found useful recommending to everyone, make sure that uh, the, uh, the software which you are running inside of containers is also kept secure because it's uh, the software you use to build the, the container or build the image and people tend to forget about it. So they are used to patching uh, and updating servers and virtual machines, not so much containers. So we created plugin for Zipper, 
Zipper is a package management tool for SLES, for Swiss Enterprise Server. We created a plugin called Zipper Docker you can use to inspect both container images as well as containers for missing updates. And you can use it to patch conta uh, container images inside of a registry, and that way you make sure that uh, the stuff that you are running is actually secure. So if there is a bug, you figure out which images are uh, vulnerable, you make new versions of these images, then you figure out which containers are vulnerable, and you stop them and run them from, from these images, images again. And uh, the final item regarding containers is orchestration, because running containers on one host is perfectly fine. It's definitely fine for system containers. For application containers, the, the biggest advantage is to run them like in, in very big amounts, like scaled uh, into uh, something what a single machine cannot hold. So it's very good to set up clusters, and orchestration technology is, uh, is helpful there. So we are focusing on Kubernetes as the orchestration technology, and uh, you see some of these uh, use cases which are very good, or where the containers and orchestration technology fits very well. And it can range different uh, use cases from like microservices, based architectures, server starting applications on demand, or continuous integration pipelines. All these use cases are very good if you want to start playing with containers. And uh, one item, uh, one last slide on, on the container picture is uh, how it all fits together. So we talked about OpenStack a little bit. So you have a data center with all the resources like compute storage network, and you can have OpenStack uh, handling all the like, complete data center, but yet when you want to have some teams which act in a different, uh, different way, they are more agile, more quick, they want to do stuff on their own, not really wait for the admin to assign stuff to them. So what you can do, you can uh, set up a Kubernetes cluster and uh, using Magnum, connect that to the OpenStack environment and still you have OpenStack managing the complete data center and have containers running it, uh, as, a, as part of that. And we have overview on one side over everything and these guys who are running uh, or who are doing agile can do their stuff in that, in that particular corner. <coughs> so that's uh, how you can take advantage of all the technologies at once. Obviously you can pick whatever you fit, whatever fits you, just the containers or just virtualization or whatever, but you can also do everything and have a like, complete story there. With that, uh, some of the resources, I mean, uh, this is what you will get in the deck. We have recorded some mini videos on Docker. There is a quick, quick start if you want to play with that. And this is all part of Susan's Enterprise Server 12. So you don't need any other products to start playing with, with Docker uh, and uh, Docker containers and register and everything. And with that, I guess I'm through the slides. Yeah, are there any questions? We're about out of time. If you do have questions, topics you want to talk about, come find us. We're happy to spend some time with you, and we appreciate your attention. Okay, thank you very much.